afternoon and welcome back to Causes of Crime with Ash and Nan. Per usual, we're coming to you live from Hamill headquarters. Today we're doing things differently. First of all, we have a new setup. And second of all, we're gonna revisit a case that we've previously explored. One of our lawyer viewers geniusly suggested that we interpret the same case from last week, but using macro theories as opposed to micro theories. Shout out to Dr. Jennifer Hamill for the amazing suggestion. If you missed last week's episode, here's a brief recap of the facts of the Weaver case. In 1981, Ward Weaver Jr. randomly pulled over to assist a stranded army recruit and the recruit's girlfriend. He then murdered the recruit, raped and murdered the woman, and buried her body in his backyard. 21 years later, in 2002, Weaver Jr.'s son, Ward Weaver III, murdered two 12-year-old girls who he kidnapped two months apart on their way to the bus stop. He also pled guilty to the rape of his son's 19-year-old girlfriend and to the rape of another 15-year-old girl. Twelve years later, in 2014, Francis Weaver, Weaver the third stepson, murdered a Canby County man in what is said to be a drug deal gone awry. How can this family tree of violence be explained? So now that everyone is all caught up, let's get to analyzing. But this week, we're going to do things a little differently. As I said, one of us will explain our theory and how it relates to the Weaver case, and the other has to guess the theory. The first host who gets three points, that'll be me, gets to win. Let's flip a coin to see who goes first. I'm calling heads. <laughs> Tails. Darn. This first theory states that people commit crimes when their social learning results in their favoring of crime exceeding their favoring of more conventional behavior. So this occurs when a person has an excess of deviant people in their lives. So the presence of their deviant fathers because it resulted in the sons favoring criminal behavior rather than more conventional behaviors exhibiting the notions of this theory. Oh, that's Edwin Sutherland's theory of differential association thought of in 1956. You gotta come harder than that nuns. Watch, this is how it should go. This theory is a step up above yours. It states that one doesn't necessarily have to have a personal relationship with the person to learn their criminal behaviors. They simply have to identify with them. This makes sense due to the fact that Weaver Jr. was not as active in Weaver III's life. Trish and Weaver Jr. separated before Weaver Jr. went to the Army. And even after that, he spent a long time on death row for murdering an Air Force recruit and his girlfriend. Really, Ash? You literally said one of the key words in your little spiel. You're referring to Daniel Glasser's theory of differential identification. And you're right, it does explain how the fathers had influences on their sons' lives, even with their frequency behind bars. But let's see if you can guess this one. I can. This theory is centered around impulsive, reckless, and insensitive behavior. All characteristics of the Weaver men is evidenced by their activities like sexual abuse, domestic violence, and even murder. So the theory traces these behaviors back to poor parenting, an idea that's very plausible given the situation at hand. Hershey and Dockerson believe that people possessing these traits are likely to commit deviant acts even if their social bonds are strong. You almost had me with that one until you said the names of the theories. That's clearly got the student Hershey's theory of self-control. It's an expansion of the social control theory, which states that criminality is linked to the ties that people have with society. Okay, here's another one for you. It's quite similar to some of the other ones we've discussed. and actually builds on the theory of differential association. That's a hint, because I know you'll need it. So this theory states that people are motivated to commit criminal or otherwise deviant behavior because they are exposed to those who model delinquent behavior and there is some differential reinforcement. That is to say, rewards or other pros resulting from committing the acts. Like some of the aforementioned theories, this one deals with role models. People look up to others who exhibit negative behavior and somehow decide that the positive consequences outweigh the negative. Girl, you thought you were going to stump me. That is clearly Aker's social learning and differential reinforcement theory. It's easily applied to the Weaver case if we consider how Francis Weaver seemingly learned his recklessness from Ward Weaver III, who learned murder from Ward Weaver Jr. So it's an interesting one, though, because there don't seem to be any real like positive reinforcements that would lead each son to follow in his father's footsteps. I guess that's where micro theories are useful. Okay, so this next theory is a little weird to apply to the case because it would imply that the Weavers were no different from the rest of society, but most people don't commit rape and murder. What I want to highlight, though, is an extension of this theory which states that once someone is labeled to be something, he or she is likely to fulfill the traits associated with I must with stop the you right there because I already know what it is. It's Tenenbaum's dramatization of evil theory, which, like you said, is a little iffy. One wouldn't be exaggerated to say that these men are all deviant criminals. 
However, the part that you were trying to get at is that it is the self-fulfilling prophecy theory. We see this in this case when the mother, Trish, would constantly bite Weaver III in an effort to ensure that he did not become like his father. It seems as though her exaggerated aims at getting him to be different from Ward Weaver Jr. actually led him to become more like the man. And guess what? That's three. I guess I won. That's unfair, though. The only reason you won is because I said the first clue. <laughs> well, I guess some of us are natural born winners, just as Cesar Lombroso believed that some of us are born criminals. <laughs> Remember that theory from last week? <laughs> well, anyways, let's move on before Nani gets even more jealous. Whatever. Now is the time when we hear from our viewers at home. This episode, we'll be communicating with you guys through social media since we're attempting to be a little bit more tech savvy here at Hamel headquarters. All right, so let's see, let's see what we have here. Okay, so Twitter user at I Love Soch220 tweeted, "This isn't really a contribution, but how does the Weavers family case relate to the typology of deviant behavior?" That's actually a great question, right? Becker's typology of behavior states that individuals can be labeled deviant even when they have not committed crime, just as people could have committed law violations but not have been caught and thus not labeled. So this chart is a great representation of the theory. You see, all of the Weaver men have partaken in non-conforming behavior, as we know, and they've all been detected of doing so, spending time in prison, jail, and the juvenile detention center. Thus, in regards to Becker's theory, they would be considered pure deviant. Good point. Well, everyone, it looks like we're out of time. I know, sorry. But thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed our segment today, and we will see you next time on Causes of Crime with Ash and Nan.